zitten. De heer Kevin Peterson, geboren op de Mountain View, California, USA, op 1 oktober 1965, in het bezit van de academische graad van Doctor of Medicine, uitgereikt in 1997 door de University of Nevada, USA, heeft een proefschrift ingediend tot het verkrijgen van de academische graad van Doctor in de Medische Wetenschappen. De titel van het proefschrift luidt Optimizing HIV Care in West Africa. Bovendien heeft hij met goed gevolg de doctoraatsopleiding voltooid. We verwelkomen de verschillende leden van de jury. Professor Emeritus Kies MacAdam, Emeritus Professor van de London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, United Kingdom. Professor Steven Callens van het departement Inwendige Geneeskunde, Universitair Ziekenhuis Gent. Professor Kolenbunders, promotor. Ikzelf, professor Berneman van de afdeling Hematologie van de Universiteit Antwerpen en professor Jean-Pierre van Geertruyde van de faculteit Geneeskunde en Gezondheidswetenschappen. De verschillende leden van de jury hebben geoordeeld dat het proefschrift kan verdedigd worden. Ik geef nu het woord aan de kandidaat om gedurende 35 minuten zijn proefschrift voor te stellen, waarna we tot de vraagstelling zullen overgaan. So we invite Dr. Kevin Peterson to present his thesis regarding optimizing HIV care in West Africa. We um, acknowledge the different members of the jury, Professor Emeritus Kees McAdam from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Professor Stephen Callens from the uh, again, University Hospital, Professor Kolenbunders from the University of Antwerp and from the um, Institute of Tropical Medicine of Antwerp, myself, and uh, Professor Jean-Pierre van Geertruyde from the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Antwerp. You have 35 minutes to defend your thesis and then we will go over to the questions. Maar Kevin, dan gaat hij gewoon dicht, hè? Oh, yes. Yes, it will. Ja, de technicus het eventjes regelen. Ik kan eventjes wachten totdat de technicus ons ermee helpt. Maar het is niet het moment om de updates. Kun je er iets aan doen? Nee, ik moet het niet. Zullen we dat nu opnieuw opstarten en dan is het... Ja. Ik denk dat het beter is om het nu op te starten, want anders gaat het dan te stoppen. Ja, ik denk dat we... Elke start, ik zou het gewoon opstarten. Het zal niet zo lang duren, maar als het in het midden onderbroken wordt. Ik denk dat het beter is op zich. Thank <laughs> you. 
also uh, tried to come to to talk with Jean Pierre Van Gietro, the, the also the jury member who is in Africa, and maybe this manipulations have changed a little bit uh, set up here. <coughs> several sections with brief orientation to HIV, the Gambia where most of my research took place, uh, antiretroviral therapy for HIV-2, and then we'll discuss uh, adherence to antiretroviral therapy. HIV, HIV brings about clinical disease by driving down the CD4 count, which, as it decays, leaves the individual vulnerable to an increasing array of progressively more serious opportunistic infections. The, the viral load is largely stable over, over most of this uh, illness. Antiretroviral therapy suppresses the viral load and to some degree reverses this process and allows the CD4 count to uh, reassert itself. HIV has claimed over 25 million lives, and of those currently living with HIV, 23 million of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa. This map, this is not normally how we look at the world, but here, the area of the country represents the absolute number of HIV-infected individuals, whereas the depth of the color represents the percentage of 15 to 49-year-old individuals in that country thought to be infected. HIV-2 is, uh, is a cousin of the HIV-1 that uh, we've all heard so much about, HIV-2 has a different uh, genetic lineage. It's associated with a lower viral load, lower rates of transmission, and slower progression for most of the people infected. 80 to 90 percent of those infected with HIV-2 will have a, a slow or non-progressive disease. However, for those in, who have progressive disease, the clinical syndrome is indistinguishable from HIV-1. This shows the regions most affected by HIV-2. So you can see it's predominantly a West African uh, illness. It has the highest prevalence is in Guinea-Bissau. It has been spread to other Portuguese colonies, to Portugal. It has spread throughout the world, while at the same time in West Africa, it is being displaced by HIV-1. When HIV particles infect the CD4 cell, they fuse, unbind, release their genetic material, which needs to be converted into a form which can then be integrated into the host cell DNA and then guide the production of more viral particles. These are the major classes of antiretroviral medicines which we use to control HIV. These in green are the ones which are effective in HIV-2, and it's not all of the protease inhibitors uh, count. The antiretrovirals have been designed for HIV-1, and there have been no clinical trials of antiretroviral therapy in HIV-2. The, the therapy for HIV-2, which was commonly used at the time of my work in the Gambia, uh, 
was the WHO approved triple nucleoside regimen or commonly an unboosted indinavir and these regimens had appalling uh, efficacy rates. Because HIV has a high mutation rate, it is necessary to treat it typically with three antiretrovirals at the same time and with a high degree of adherence. To maintain this high degree of adherence is challenging because there are many factors that play into it. I'm going to discuss a couple of them. A key element in the management of HIV is counseling because the client or patient needs to understand what's going on, why these drugs are necessary, and how vitally important it is in their long-term health to maintain a high degree of adherence. We're, we're going to talk specifically today about uh, mental illness and I've selected two uh, mental illnesses to discuss, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, in part because they are commonly seen in HIV infection, and they are treatable, and they, uh, and they have a negative effect on one's adherence to antiretroviral therapy. Gambia is here, nestled within Senegal, following the course of the River Gambia. The British Medical Research Councils have had a research station in Fajara on the coast since 1947. The overall prevalence of HIV in the Gambia is low. I showed you that large map where South Africa hangs on the bottom end, full and red. And the prevalence of HIV in the Gambia is considerably lower. It's approximately 2%, uh, half a percent of HIV-2. And since the initiation of antiretroviral therapy, the rollout of antiretroviral therapy in the Gambia, this has dropped down to approximately 1.3%. Antiretroviral therapy has been available in the Gambia since 2004. Here we see a, a picture of the Gambian president who made international news, particularly in 2007 and 2008, when he was promoting his herbal treatment of HIV. MRC has been involved with HIV in the Gambia from the first case identified. Starting in 1998, a, a structured follow-up of the HIV cohort was formalized, and alongside research, palliative care was provided to nearly all of the Gambia's identified HIV patients. Starting in 2004, MRC formed one of the uh, key components of the National Antiretroviral Program. The Genitourinary Medicine Clinic at MRC is where this HIV care takes place. And I had the, uh, the privilege to lead this clinic for over six years. This was a well-resourced clinic, as you can see by these photos. We had we were able to provide quality care for our patients at essentially no cost to them. Both inpatient and outpatient care, they paid nothing for medications, laboratory studies, including viral loads. They were refunded money for their transport based on their home address. We also followed up individuals who didn't show, telephoning them or, if need be, sending a motorcyclist out uh, to their home if they'd given us permission to do that. Our, our medical records, our laboratory records, were all double entered into a database for research purposes. Today I'm going to talk about two specific goals. One, 
is the improvement of antiretroviral therapy for HIV-2, and another is to explore predictors of adherence. And I'm going to describe five studies in the, in the course of the next half hour. Initially, I'd like to describe our cohort study. This was published in 2011. And here we had over well, approximately 360 patients that we had followed. We had baseline information, follow-up data on their adherence, their viral loads, their CD4 counts. Patients in our program were treated with a standard regimen with modifications I won't go into, but basically two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and for those infected with HIV-1, nivirapine, and for those infected with HIV-2, boosted lopinavir. We were the first uh, HIV-2 cohort to roll out uh, lopinavir in its care in its treatment. And there are two comparisons I'd like to highlight from paper. One is HIV-1 versus HIV-2 and their response to treatment. <coughs> and another is the mortality that our patients had, the early mortality prior to six months and the late mortality after six months or more on therapy. The so you can see our HIV-2 patients were somewhat older. They had a higher CD4 count, so less advanced <laughs> disease. They had a lower viral load. These are, this is a logarithmic scale, where every one here represents a factor of 10. And this, this difference between HIV-1 and HIV-2 is consistent with the natural history of HIV-2 as most of these individuals would have lower viral load, therefore less progressive disease, and would appear with symptoms at a later age. This is called the survival curve, and here you see the percentage of people on therapy who stay alive for HIV-2 and HIV-1. And you see also the percentage of people over time who maintain an undetectable viral load for HIV-2 and HIV-1. So you can see with this graph that the people with HIV-2 had a much better chance of surviving <coughs> than those with HIV-1 and were more likely to be able to keep their virus suppressed. For comparison purposes, I've included in this diagram the historical data from our clinic prior to the availability of antiretroviral therapy, where the, this would be the 12-month survival of those with HIV-2, and those with HIV-1 following diagnosis, this would be their, this would be their survival in our cohort, in our setting. This is, this is a somewhat complicated graph for those of you who are used to looking at CD4 graphs because this is related to the change in CD4 count. So what I'd like to point out here is that in following therapy, initiation of antiretroviral therapy, the individuals with HIV-1 have a better increase in their CD4 count than those with HIV-2. And it takes two years before this evens out. <coughs> Excuse me. This is, by the way, controlling for CD4 count at baseline, which has an influence on people's recovery. Early mortality. The, these things represent advanced disease, anemia, low weight, low CD4 count. This is a very low CD4 count. And these, we saw that these things were related to mortality shortly after starting antiretroviral therapy. 
male sex was also related to early mortality, as was initiating intraretroviral therapy during the periods 2007-2008. Looking at late mortality, the individuals, sorry, looking at late mortality, these markers of advanced disease fall away, and your advanced disease at baseline is no longer predictive of your long-term mortality in our cohort. Male sex remains a risk factor, and starting your antiretroviral therapy in the years 2007 and 2008, compared to 2004, 5, and 6, remains a risk factor. Those are the numbers for late mortality. So now I would like to describe a case series of non-Gambian patients provided a regimen containing raltegravir. That was our raltegravir. <clears throat> our five patients had extensive, most of them had extensive antiretroviral therapy and had an excellent outcome, a sustained viral suppression, on the basis of a regimen that contained raltegravir plus other active drugs, drugs which um, either based on genotype or by our knowledge of the, the likely untyped resistance patterns were presumed to have uh, residual potency. This is important because prior to this, the case studies and the case series that had been done with raltegravir showed a poor, a poor outcome in spite of the in vitro effectiveness of this drug. So what we were able to show was that lopinavir, boosted lopinavir regimens are effective in HIV-2 in treatment naive individuals, and that if paired with other effective drugs, raltegravir-based therapy could be effective in, in uh, HIV-2. Now I'd like to shift gears, and I'd like to talk about factors related to adherence. One of our studies was on education and literacy, which we published in 2010. <coughs> this is a retrospective study where, with 48 weeks of follow-up, where we looked at 147 patients for whom we had uh, information on literacy or education and their follow-up. 37% were described themselves as functionally literate. 79% uh, achieved undetectable viral loads at one year. These education rates are typical for the Gambia. And what we found was that people with education, that's at least three years of school, as opposed to less than three years of school, and people who were literate had a much better chance of having an undetectable viral load, both at six months and at 12 months. Our, our illiterate patients were much more likely to report that, that they had missed doses in the month preceding their clinic visit. And so on the, on this basis, we, and the fact that there was uh, presumably very little resistance in the Gambia, we draw the conclusion that these benefits are mediated through adherence, that our educated literate patients adhere better to therapy and get better results. As a result, we recommend that, that education be assessed as a risk factor for adherence, so that, uh, so that the illiterate or less educated patients can get the necessary appropriate pre antiretroviral counseling. Now I'd like to move on and talk about depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. We did two studies. One looking at individuals prior to initiating antiretroviral therapy, which we published in 2011. Here, every third patient coming for their routine scheduled pre-antiretroviral counseling 
gave answers to this uh, depression questionnaire, the Center for Epidemiological Studies 10-item depression questionnaire, and the impact of event scale. These are screening tools used to identify individuals with symptoms of depression and PTSD. These instruments were translated into local languages and administered verbally to our patients. There are 10 items in this score, no surprise. The, they are ranked zero to three on the basis of the frequency with which each item reflects the individual's experience in the week prior to the, the test. Similarly for the IASR. And there's standard cutoffs related from what represents a positive test. When do we, when do we have to worry that that person is either depressed or experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder? What we found was that over 40% of our patients prior to initiating antiretroviral therapy had positive screening tests. Over 50% had one or the other, and over 30% had both. So this is a high prevalence. Given this high prevalence, we assert that patients need to be screened because these are risk factors for adherence. And also, these people need to be able to access further treatment. We followed this study up with the similar instruments looking now at people who are on antiretroviral therapy. This was published in 2012. We wanted to see if this would be different. Here, 252 patients seen in routine follow-up were administered these same questionnaires. And here you can see, it's typical for our clinic, mostly women, middle-aged. When they started antiretroviral therapy, their CD4 counts were low. A normal is 800 to 1,000 in uh, Europe, perhaps uh, somewhat less in West Africa. Um, and on average, they've been followed for two years and had, at the time of enrollment in this study, a really vigorous CD4 response. Some had already gone on to second-line therapy. Most had achieved an undetectable viral load and maintained it. And what we found was that the prevalence of a positive screen was dramatically lower for depression and somewhat lower for uh, PTSD. Women tended to score higher on these on these screening instruments, and those who had already failed one regimen and were on their second line treatment tended to score higher on the test of depression. <clears throat> so, what we've seen is that with antiretroviral therapy, the prevalence of Depressive symptoms drops dramatically. PTSD symptoms drop. And it was, this is, this is a, uh, this is a study done at one time. These are not the same people that we did, that we saw years earlier. And so we can't draw the, connect the dots and say, we saw them and they got better. We saw those people, and now we saw these people, and these people are better. Other studies, including one published last year from Uganda, do show that in a longitudinal, in a longitudinal study, it's a, largely an effect of antiretroviral therapy itself and people getting better. Or it's clear to us, based on our experience, that shorter instruments were needed. This was uh, burdensome to administer in a routine clinic. Now, I'd like to I'd like to summarize some of my highlights and recommendations on the basis of, on the basis of uh, this work. For HIV-2, we demonstrated that boosted lopinavir was effective and we recommended it should be used in low-resource settings. We showed that raltegravir was potentially effective 
in first or second line therapy for HIV, for HIV-2. But it's, it remains a challenge that we, all of this data is uh, cohort data, or case series. What, what is lacking are clinical trials where people are randomized to different regimens. That has not yet been done for HIV-2. There are not as many people with HIV-2 as there are with HIV-1. And so it's clear that the existing HIV-2 cohorts scattered throughout the world need to be merged in order to be able to answer important questions related to this group. Um, okay. With regards to adherence, we identified we identified two threats to adherence, low literacy and low levels of education, or lack of formal education. We believe that interventional studies are needed. We need to see what works, what can be done to help these individuals to better adhere to their antiretroviral therapy. Depression and post-traumatic stress disorder were common in our HIV-infected individuals. In the Gambia and in many other similar settings, there is a lack of adequate treatment capacity to treat depression in those people who are identified with it. We feel that additional research needs to be done in longitudinal studies of depression to see the changes over time and as they relate to therapy and symptoms. It's clear that briefer screening tools need to be validated for use in Sub-Saharan Africa. And key, we need to look again at what are the interventions that work for treating depression and PTSD. There's some preliminary work that has been done, but this is an area that needs a lot more attention. Also, since depression, PTSD, education, since these help us to see people who are at risk for problems with adherence, this needs to be assessed prior to the initiation of antiretroviral therapy so that additional resources can be targeted at those individuals at risk. Thinking a bit more broadly, if we're going to optimize care in West Africa or in similar, similar places, <coughs> we need to improve access to effective antiretroviral therapy. We need to avoid needless delay. And yet, when we are seeing people in that period between their diagnosis and initiation of antiretroviral therapy, we need to be using that time in order to <coughs> identify those risks to their adherence in order to help them to succeed on this life-saving therapy. And finally, this is how I would this is how I would conclude. Quality care costs money and it's worth it. Thank you for your attention. Professor Macadam to fire the first questions. Kevin, well done. You know, this story started for me about 12 years ago when I met this man who was swinging his children on a swing in California. And now here he is, an experienced tropical physician 
who succeeded in transforming a clinic into what you see. So it's a very exciting picture for me of what's happened in 12 years, from being a physician in California to being a very successful physician, research physician, uh, in a population in the Gambia. So congratulations. I really enjoyed your thesis and your presentation. I think it was high quality and uh, exciting for me to read. Concise and uh, beautifully written. So I'd like to ask a couple of questions, if I might. The first is about mortality. And all over Africa, uh, there have been high mortalities after diagnosis of HIV positivity. Um, before people start on antiretroviral therapy and shortly after they start. Now, I'd like to ask, with the experience you've got, first of all, what that mortality was in the Gambia between diagnosis and starting ART, and secondly, what you do to reduce that. Well, I think that um, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that mortality was uh, pneumonia, diarrhea, and tuberculosis. <coughs> That's certainly not a comprehensive list. Um, and I think that getting that mortality under control is, is a key issue, and it really relates to the period prior to starting intratrial therapy, and also there's some rough waters in the period shortly after. In the Gambia, we lost about a third of our patients between diagnosis and enrolling for care. Those are people who are gone. They're gone to the system, and they have a progressive disease. Um, we lost another third to um, who were lost to follow up or or died between initiating care and getting people stabilized on care. If we call that say three months out, um, where people have begun to show uh, a good response. A significant part of that is uh, immune reconstitution syndrome, discussed in one of the papers in the thesis. But I think that while there are things we can do to screen for latent diseases and take proactive measures to prevent immunoconstitution syndrome, the, the greater tragedy for me is the people who simply wash out of the system. They're lost to follow up. They can't, they can't manage the transport to come out even if the transport is paid for them. They, uh, they're too afraid to engage in the system if they're afraid to disclose to their spouses and, and talk about their disease. And uh, these are the losses that are, in some sense, medically, uh, they're, they're really more logistical problems. But tragic to think that we're losing people just due to logistical barriers. Can I just uh, try and remember the words you've just said? That 33% 30, 30 are lost before they start antiretrovirals, and another 30% are lost before three months of treatment. So that's a huge percentage, and you reckon that the main problems are diarrheal disease, pneumonias, TB. That's, uh, that's a bit of a shoot from the hip guess. Uh, well, let me, let's just assume for a moment you're right. And TB is the main cause of death, as is frequently said in your thesis. What can you do that's better than just screening for TB with, um, with the most modern techniques? I mean, could you assume that 80% have met TB in their life before? That's, a, that's an, excellent, uh, an excellent question. And I recall that Professor Cora at MRC was keen to look at presumptive therapy for tuberculosis. 
in uh, in our patient group because of the because of the implications. I think that expanding access to to X-rays is worthwhile. Um, but you said the most modern available. Most places in Sub-Saharan Africa, I don't think, are using X-rays as part of their routine inpatient intake. Um, but we certainly picked up many suspicious cases that way. If we wanted to, I have to say, I feel like pushing me towards that uh, that question of do we treat presumptively or not. I think we need to maintain a very low threshold, and in particular, people with uh, vague constitutional symptoms, uh, fevers, uh, um, uh, weight loss, certainly people with cough, I mean, but beyond them, I think we need to keep a, a, uh, a low threshold for uh, initiating care. I'm not quite ready to say we should treat everybody walking through the door as if they had TB, at least in the Gambia. In another setting, perhaps, and with, uh, with modern Testing also be able to demonstrate resistance in areas such as South Africa, uh, where where uh, resistance TB is such a clear problem. I think that's that's worth doing. Thank you. The other prophylaxis before we get on to TB prophylaxis is uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, septrin prophylaxis, widely practiced, given to everyone. What's it done to the drug resistance patterns of uh, organisms that are normally commensals? That's, uh, that's a, another good question. What, uh, in, in a Western practice, I'm rather inclined to be careful with antibiotics and try to aim for narrow spectrum and such. Um, you can tell I'm not a surgeon. But the in the... Uh, the mortality benefit from treatment with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for those with HIV uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa is so clear that I think we need to take that risk. What is interesting is that in a study in the Ivory Coast years ago, um, they demonstrated uh, resistance rates climbing without that affecting the mortality that their HIV patients experience. That is to say, you still got the benefit from using trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole in your HIV patients while, the, uh, while it was clear that there was some uh, increase in resistance, not just in commensals, but also in, in pathogenic organisms. I think if we want to look at uh, if you want to look at antibiotic resistance, I wouldn't start by taking something that saves lives. I would, I would start by looking at chicken feed. I'll move from chicken feed, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to move on to adherence issues, and much of your thesis dealt with these. And I thought particularly interesting was your depression um, your depression studies. And I, I just wonder, you mentioned that it took about a quarter of an hour of a physician's time, or someone's time someone's in the time. clinic, to administer those questionnaires. That's a long time in a busy clinic. Did you try and cut it down and find which were the discriminating questions amongst the 22 or so that you were asking? And if so, have those yet been validated? Could you ask two or three questions and get the same answer as 22? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, we didn't do the research, but uh, others have. The, my, there are two item questionnaires, uh, three item questionnaires, five item questionnaires, and I would probably, I would probably not screen for PTSD because I think depression is more important. I think we should get depression screening in place. Uh, I think that has a real clear benefit. PTSD 
which in our case also required a longer questionnaire, is less clearly associated with adherence challenges. And we could go into that more if you'd like. The, um, if I was going to do depression screening, so I would already cut off two thirds. If I was going to do depression screening, I'd use, I'd use the PHQ-2, which is basically two questions on, uh, on depressive mood. Do you remember what those are? I wish I did. But no. I just wondered how many in the room were suffering. One is, <laughs> one is, are you feeling depressed? Um, and I forgot what the other one was. But it, what is interesting is that even though that seems, that sort of question which has a face validity, uh, like it looks like that asks something, I don't trust those in, in general in psychology because obviously people see it and they know what's being asked. But yet the, it works. And I would like to see such an instrument uh, tested in a larger scale in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly if you can then move people into treatment. I have some moral qualms about testing people for diseases that I can't treat. You mention in passing cognitive behavior therapy and how relevant and possible that would be in the scale that you've uh, identified here. Uh, how do you feel about starting cognitive behavior therapy in the Gambia? If, if I was a 25-year-old psychologist living in the Gambia, that would be my priority right now. I think that there's, there's uh, there's one study on group cognitive behavioral therapy done in HIV, and I think it was in Kenya, uh, that I found really exciting because obviously part of the challenge is with a lack of trained healthcare workers in, in the cadre of, cadre of uh, psychologists, in particular psychiatrists, that that has not received much priority for the scarce funding available for healthcare in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. I, I think you have to look at some way where you can, you can multiply the effect of the individual. So the one hour, one on one sessions, even though I, I had those done pre and trial counseling for my HIV patients, I had a lot more HIV counselors than, I, than psychiatrists. So I think looking at group counseling is a, is, and cognitive behavioral therapy is, I think, the model to follow for depression therapy at this time. I mean, just in passing, I'm involved with a study in Tanzania at the moment where we are teaching five life skills and are doing much the same as, as, um, as you'd expect from um, group, group, group therapy. therapy and really um, changing people around from being patients to being part of the change for society, which might be worth looking at further. I'd like to end by asking a couple of questions, if I may, Kevin. One is that, you know, you've spent 10 years getting here, but this is the beginning of your life now. <laughs> so where do you go next? What is, what is the, the question? I've heard that TB treatment ought to be, but isn't the top question. So what is? Hmm. <laughs> um, what is the question? Can I limit that maybe to HIV or to, to Africa? Or, or can I, do you want me to take on the question? Oh, sorry. Let's leave out God. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's just talk about HIV and what you've done, if you had your time starting now, where would you focus? Hmm. Right now, we have effective therapy, and we have people who aren't getting it. So that seems like an obvious place to start. That's not necessarily my job as a clinician, but certainly as a as an advocate for my patients. Um, 
it's, it's my role to speak out and say, here is life-saving therapy, and people die from its lack every day. And I, I find that gone. So I would, I would like to see that better. That is a larger question than I myself, starting today, um, feel equipped to really change these macroeconomic issues. Um, but I think that's, the, that's maybe number one. If we don't have the global investment in treating a lethal infectious disease in our midst, um, it's, it's like, what's a, the vaccinations are great. But I mean, once you move past vaccinations, what's the, what's the next great thing to be able to invest money in for quality of life? And I, I think HIV treatment uh, is certainly highly ranked. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. I give the word to Professor Callens now. Thank you. Um, well, <clears throat> it's always difficult to come after an eloquent speaker. So, but uh, he didn't want 